A lot of people have called The Witcher 3 a masterpiece. If that's true, if it is a masterpiece, it's a very, very flawed one. But for all its flaws, there is something special about it. And a lot of people have said a lot of things about this game, most of which is in the form of praise and has resulted in certain narratives about what makes this game great. And I think those narratives have got a lot of things wrong. The Witcher 3 is a great game, but it's not great as an open world game. Its open world has many problems, and a lot of the modern trends that have led to people starting to feel disillusioned with the concept of open world games are present here. It's also not an amazing RPG. Opportunities for role-playing are quite limited, and the RPG systems that have come to define the genre are either shallow or poorly implemented. The Witcher 3 also doesn't have an amazing main storyline. There are plenty of valid reasons to enjoy its story, but the main storyline has serious problems and it falls apart a bit towards the end of the game. Of course, The Witcher 3 is a great game, it's just not necessarily great for the reasons sometimes attributed to it. I want to expand on those statements, but before that, it really is worth considering how The Witcher 3 has been and continues to be talked about. All great games generate a certain degree of hype that seems to subside a bit over time, but the hype for The Witcher 3 still seems to be going strong. This game has generated a huge amount of passion, and that in itself is a great thing, but I think it's diluted discussions about the game at times. As with all things that get a lot of praise and attention, The Witcher 3 has become somewhat polarising. This has resulted in things like YouTube videos that sing praise for the game in somewhat hyperbolic ways, as well as a certain level of backlash against the game for being overrated. Perhaps it's a part of internet culture, that opinions seem to get exaggerated and people tend to gravitate towards extremes. But in the case of The Witcher 3, I think the discourse that surrounds this game has meant real critiques of its flaws have been somewhat lacking. The Witcher 3's flaws are real, and they are many, but they don't necessarily take away from its good qualities. People can get too caught up with review scores and with the certain mindsets that they breed, where everything has to be rated and Metacritic scores are everything. People make the mistake of assessing games as starting as 10 out of 10s and then subtracting points for each flaw. Or they try to line up the good and the bad parts of a game in some imaginary mathematical equation that is meant to produce some meaningful and objective numerical representation of quality. Thinking in these ways can lead you to missing the point of it. Metacritic scores do tell you something, but they certainly don't tell you everything. Too much emphasis on scores and objectivity can lead you to seriously undervaluing how good the good parts of a game are. And it can also lead to a certain defensiveness when it comes to admitting the flaws in things you like, as if by admitting to their existence your love for something has to be lessened as a result. But that's not true. A lot of the greatest things in life are also heavily flawed, because to be truly great involves taking risks and pushing limits and exposing yourself to failure. Greatness never comes from playing it safe and focusing solely on minimising flaws. So it's important to look at both sides, to acknowledge both a game's flaws and its strengths, and to know that each of these doesn't invalidate the other. The different reactions people have to this game make sense, both the ones calling it a masterpiece and the ones calling it overrated. It just depends on what part of the experience matters to you. Different people have different values for different things, and this leads to different opinions. And people don't need to agree with one another, but it's always good to understand each other. And so it's my hope that this video will explain why some people love this game so much, as well as explaining why others don't. Because to really understand this game, you need to look at both. But before this video truly gets underway, there are two more things I need to cover. The first is to at least acknowledge how The Witcher 3 fits into the story of Seto Project. I don't want to spend too much time on this, as there's too much to say about The Witcher 3 already. But as this is something I covered in previous videos, I think it at least deserves being mentioned. The Witcher 3 was a huge success, both in terms of reviews, sales and fan reception. It went on to win a large number of Game of the Year awards, apparently more than any other game, although there's reasons why that statistic may be misleading. But it's still an incredible achievement, especially when you consider how far Seto Project have come and how they managed to consistently build on their successes despite many things going wrong along the way. They've won themselves many fans, not just for the games they've produced, but also their willingness to support their games with regular patches, DRM-free versions and free DLC, 
and all these things were continued by The Witcher 3. And while who knows what the future has in store, for now, the love they receive does seem fairly well deserved. The final thing I need to say is this video will contain many spoilers for The Witcher 3, although spoilers for the other Witcher games and the book should be kept to a minimum. The official press release announcing The Witcher 3 included the announcement of its open world that was promised to be larger than any other in modern RPG history. I remember reading this announcement as a Witcher fan and being nervous. At the time, open worlds seemed very risky and hard to pull off. It's strange how that was only five years ago, because in that time, open worlds have not only become more common, but somehow they now seem safe, and the entire concept of open world games borders on being formulaic and sterile. The reason for that is in part because of the rise of what seems best described as the Ubisoft model. The Ubisoft model can be loosely described as an open world with a checklist of things to do, structured as easy to find points of interest on a map, but each have one objective for the player to complete and you unlock these map markers through interacting with some kind of watchtower. This open world design was popularised by Ubisoft's flagship series, but its influence has spread further than that, and it almost feels like these games are becoming their own genre. And this is what The Witcher 3 resembles. It's an open world that follows the Ubisoft model pretty closely. The points of interest are easily comparable, the minimap even resembles Far Cry, and watchtowers do exist. They're just called notice boards. It's nice you don't have to climb them, but they really do function in the exact same way. Interacting with a notice board unlocks question marks that you can then move to one after the other without any need to actually explore or think for yourself. The entire Ubisoft model of open world design has some obvious flaws. It's boring to explore, overly easy to complete tasks in, and it gets very repetitive after a certain amount of time. And these criticisms apply to The Witcher 3's open world, but the Ubisoft model is supposed to serve a purpose. It provides a content delivery system, allowing you to see the best parts of the game world while making incremental progress towards some meta-objectives and getting small rewards on the way. I'm not really a fan personally, but some people like this and find it satisfying and hey, that's their opinion. But The Witcher 3 fails at this. Going from question mark to question mark and clearing out each area is not very satisfying, it's not rewarding, it doesn't show you the best content or parts of The Witcher Free's world, and worst of all, it's not particularly fun. And players will learn this. Maybe you explore the whole of White Orchard. I mean, it's not that big, and at that stage in the game, the things you're seeing are all new. Nothing has had a chance to be repetitive, and you may even be getting some in-game rewards in the way of currency and items. You may even find a few nice details, like a letter in a bandit camp that humanises those bandits and makes the world feel a bit more real. But then you get to the main map, and suddenly going to every question mark is taking a long time, and the admittedly very impressive large scale of the world might start to give you second thoughts on this approach. What's more, these points of interest may start becoming repetitive, and you realise there's only a few different types. These are bandit camps, monster nests, guarded treasures, abandoned sites, places of power, and a few variants of these. But all of these play out in the same way. There's one fight, and then you loot the area for your reward. The fight is rarely interesting, and the reward is very rarely worth anything, with places of power being the only real exception, as they at least give a skill point. The note you found at the first bandit camp was great, but by the time you get to the tenth note, or the 20th even, they start to seem a whole lot less impressive. And that treasure they might promise if you follow them feels less like a reward and more like an unnecessary chore. One more boring task stopping you getting back to the good parts of the game. The world does look good. In fact, it looks great. But you may start to realise you're barely looking at the world as you travel around, because your eyes are glued to your minimap and you never need to look away from it to find things in the world as everything important has been marked for you. But maybe you're someone who really likes points of interest, and maybe the main map of the game isn't enough to put you off. Maybe you even take a break from going to points of interest and tell yourself you'll come back to them later. But then, you get to Skellige. And Skellige's amazing. It looks gorgeous, but as you travel around you start to realise something. There's a hell of a lot of question marks out there in the water. So you go to some, in your slow boat, and you realise they're just a few chests, 
with nothing of interest inside. And then you look at your map again and you realise just how many of these there are. And maybe you start to think to yourself about how long it will take you to go to them all and the thought of doing so makes you die a little inside. And then you ask that obvious question. What the hell were the developers thinking by making all these question marks in the ocean? There is no way they could expect players to enjoy going to all of them. And then finally it hits you. This isn't really how you're meant to play The Witcher 3. The developers didn't intend for you to go to every single point of interest or to treat them like a checklist and these aren't designed to show you the best content in the game because all of the best content takes place in quests. Instead, they were designed to fill the world up with content and the way they do this shows Seda Projects inexperience with open world design. You're not meant to play The Witcher 3 like a Ubisoft game. And once you realise that, you may well enjoy the game more because there is so much content in this game that the filler points of interest aren't needed. And they work better as side activities for you to stumble upon than as a checklist you need to finish the entirety of. So playing this game like a Ubisoft game may not be very fun, but there are more ways in which open worlds add to a game experience. These are by allowing exploration, giving the player freedom, creating a fun sandbox for the player to play around in, and lastly, adding to immersion. The Witcher 3's open world fails at all but one of these. Let's go over them one by one. Exploring new worlds is in some ways the open world dream, but most games fail at making exploration engaging because exploring is easy and everything worth seeing is clearly marked. As is the case in The Witcher 3, where there's almost no reason to explore as points of interest are clearly marked and when points of interest aren't very interesting, how likely is it you'll find interesting things outside of those? Exploration isn't worthless in The Witcher 3, I'll come back to the positive sides of it later, but this game certainly isn't worth playing for the sake of exploration. Next on the list is creating player freedom. With a world as huge as The Witcher's is, it must be great to just be able to go where you want and find something to do, right? Well, no. Enemies and quests have specific levels, and fighting enemies higher level than you is incredibly slow and difficult if they are a substantially higher level than you. This gets better later on, but in the first half of the game it's clear you're not designed to fight enemies too high level, and that makes where you can go and what you can do surprisingly restrictive. The main quest is theoretically not linear in Act 1. But in practice, the game's design encourages you to take a fairly straightforward path, and you will also probably follow that same path in subsequent playthroughs. The game is designed to reward you for doing on-level quests and staying in on-level areas, and punish you for straying too far. This is not Skyrim, no matter how many times people try to make comparisons between them, and the enjoyment of the freedom The Elder Scrolls gives players for its design can't be found in The Witcher 3. Next up is the open world serving as a fun sandbox for the player to create their own enjoyment from playing around with the in-game systems. If you're unsure what I mean by this, think Grand Theft Auto, or something like Just Cause. Even before GTA Online existed, the open world in the series served as a space for you to make your own fun in. Steal cars, kill pedestrians, get chased by the cops, make a last stand in some remote corner, etc. This is sometimes referred to as emergent gameplay, but no matter what you call it, it doesn't apply much to The Witcher 3's world. The final thing on the list is where The Witcher 3's open world succeeds. Immersion. An open world is much more immersive for most players than alternative structures, as it provides a better illusion of realism. And The Witcher 3 can certainly be immersive. Its world looks real enough, and there is an incredible attention to detail. Its world is busy, with many NPCs moving around seemingly going about their lives. There's a fantastic sense of scale, something most games don't come close to, with Novigrad, the main city in The Witcher 3, actually feeling like it's a suitable size for a city. I'll talk more about the world later, but The Witcher 3 can certainly be an immersive experience if you play along and don't question things too much. As an immersive experience, it's not particularly deep. There's plenty of things that can break immersion, like being able to loot every house of all its items, while those NPCs who live there stand and watch you without the slightest concern. Well, almost every house. For some reason there is a system in place where taking items counts as stealing. Sometimes. It's not often, and when it does happen it will probably take you by surprise when a bunch of high level guards suddenly one-shot you. 
In fact, it's pretty annoying as it's a rule that's applied so inconsistently, and I've been killed when I was simply trying to talk to an NPC because I accidentally looted something next to them. It almost feels like it was a system that was planned early on and then abandoned later, but the developers didn't want to simply scrap the work they'd done so they left it intact in the few places it was already implemented. But anyway, stealing is a small thing and The Witcher 3 mostly works at providing an immersive world, particularly when you consider the size of it. And the immersion it brings may be enough of a reason to justify making The Witcher 3 an open world game. For some people, that immersion is a really big deal. However, that alone is not enough to say that The Witcher 3 is a great open world game. It is a great game with an open world. Open worlds can offer many different things, but The Witcher 3's open world fails at most of them. By now you may have noticed that the gameplay footage you're seeing doesn't have the minimap turned on. This is footage from my third playthrough of the game, and for both my second and third playthrough I had the minimap turned off. I think I first heard this suggestion from Super Bunny Hop's video on the game, and for some players this is worth trying out when you replay the game. There are a couple of things I feel I need to say about this though. The first is, this is not at all how the game is designed to be played, and doing this on your first playthrough would be frustrating as a result. I have seen it occasionally suggested that the game is designed to be able to be played with no minimap, and that isn't true. Very occasionally an NPC will give you directions, but when they do, they are usually useless like this. Why, it's that way past the hill. You walk and walk, and then you're there. Got it? Uh, no, I don't got it. Which way? Which hill? Where the fuck am I going? However, even a description like that's rare, as most times you get no directions at all. The game just assumes you will know where to go because it assumes you will have your minimap turned on. Travelling around the world without a map is not that hard. You can often follow roads or use landmarks like Crow's Perch or Bald Mountain to orient yourself, and finding your way around by yourself can be fun. Travelling around this way is also more immersive and encourages you to really look around and take in the great looking environments. The problem with playing this way is quest objectives can be hard to find. You can always open your main map to check objectives there, something you'll be forced to do often when doing quests, but doing this is time consuming and sometimes you'll have to do it multiple times. But playing without a minimap does make the open world a bit more interesting. You no longer have to think of points of interest as a checklist, you can just do the ones you stumble upon and not worry about the others. Exploration stops being quite so brainless, and as you travel around you can keep your eye out for interesting locations and then go to places you see, and doing this feels so much more organic and natural. Sometimes your curiosity can even be rewarded by finding things outside points of interest, like when following a stream to see where it takes you leads you to finding a chest. Navigating the world doesn't always work well, but learning your way around and orienting yourself can occasionally feel surprisingly satisfying, and if you do get lost your main map is still there. However, the most interesting thing about playing without a minimap is how common this suggestion seems to be amongst fans. Lots of people do this, and lots recommend for others to try it, and that must tell you something about The Witcher 3's open world. It shows there's a real desire amongst players for something more from the game's world. A desire to capture that real feeling of exploration, even if only a little bit. A desire to have some challenge in navigating, even if it's only small. A desire to have an excuse to truly look at your surroundings and take in the great sights of the world. As a result, you can't help but wish The Witcher 3's world was designed slightly differently, and I think just a few small changes could have really improved the experience. All that would need to be done is changing the minimap to be a minimalistic compass that only shows north, south, east and west, as well as the player's current objective. This way players won't travel around staring at the dotted line on the minimap, but will still have an easy way to find objectives and orient themselves. Also, remove question marks from the map, and instead only show points of interest after the player has been to them. This will discourage players from treating them as a checklist, and will make finding them feel rewarding. Some players may want to travel to every single point of interest, but that would still be possible if they use an online map, and seeing as how common smartphones are these days, playing that way shouldn't be much of an inconvenience for players who wish to still do so. Anyway, I don't want to spend too long speculating on what could be done differently. It's too easy to wish for things, and once you start, it's hard to stop. The reality of game design is also a lot more complex than the hypothetical side of it.
However, I think the fact that so many people play with the deliberate disadvantage of having the minimap turned off is proof that there is something wrong with The Witcher 3's open world design. And I hope I've explained why some people have a problem with The Witcher's open world from a gameplay perspective. Next up is The Witcher 3 as a role playing game. I don't want to waste time getting into definitions of an RPG, but I generally don't think defining what an RPG is is that important. And I disagree with people who say things like Fallout 4 isn't an RPG because of X and Y reason. In my opinion, if a game calls itself an RPG, and most people also refer to it as an RPG, then that's a good enough reason to consider it as such. After all, definitions aren't absolute, and they do change over time. Of course, that doesn't make all RPGs good RPGs. In regards to The Witcher 3, I don't think it's a bad RPG, but I do think as a role-playing game it's quite shallow. Although for what it's worth, The Witcher 3 certainly isn't the only modern RPG that that description would apply to. Some people like to argue over what is and isn't an RPG, but I'd much rather we call everything that seems like an RPG an RPG, and just accept that a game can be classified as an RPG, and that RPG can be a great game, but that doesn't guarantee that that great game is a great RPG. Anyway, enough semantics. There are three reasons why I think The Witcher 3 is a shallow role-playing experience. Opportunities to role-play are limited. The RPG systems in-game, like loot and experience points, are very poorly implemented. And lastly, quests require little thought to complete. The first of these is the most obvious, but it's also the one that is less of a flaw of the game and more of a design choice. Geralt is a defined character. Whether you prefer to play as a defined character or a custom character is down to personal choice. Each has their advantages, and as a defined character, Geralt is great. However, this obviously limits role-playing as you don't get to role-play as a character of your choosing. You also don't get to choose what role your character plays. Geralt is always a Witcher, and that is quite a narrowly defined role with a lot of meaning behind it. Geralt also has a clearly established history, and the way in which he reacts to events in game is always heavily constrained by his personality. This is not a criticism, just a statement. You do get some choice in how Geralt reacts to events and how dialogue is shaped, and you do get to play the role of Geralt of Rivia, Witcher extraordinaire. You do get to roleplay, but that roleplaying is limited. I'll talk more about dialogue and characters later, but let's move on to the next points in the list, because they are both criticisms. First up is the game's RPG systems, or RPG mechanics. These allow for character advancement, and this has always been an important part of role-playing video games. The best examples of this are experience points, loot, and money. These offer player progression systems that reward you for completing tasks in-game, and allow for your character to grow as you become higher level and get better gear. And these things are not well implemented in The Witcher 3 at all. Let's go over experience points first. As said previously, the player level and monster level are both very important in The Witcher 3 due to how levels scale. Therefore, leveling up should be very important and feel very rewarding. Except it doesn't, because it's incredibly easy to get overleveled. And even if you only do a very small amount of side quests, as I did on my third playthrough, you will still get very overleveled by the time you leave Novigrad. This is a problem as it reduces difficulty substantially, although the level scaling option for enemies that was added to the game helps alleviate this. The bigger problem is once you are overleveled, you get almost no XP for completing quests or other activities. If Geralt is 6 levels or higher above the quest level, then XP reduction kicks in and you get almost nothing. If you're 5 levels higher, however, you still get full XP. The reward doesn't scale proportionally to your level. The result of this system is almost everyone will end up overleveled, and then they get 6 levels higher than the current content and they hit a sort of soft cap. At 6 levels higher, nothing is given XP, so you stay 6 levels higher until you do higher level stuff, where the process repeats. Once the game gets going, it effectively forces you to be 6 levels higher than you should be at most times, while only giving you a real XP reward for a small amount of things you do. It's stupid, and seeing 4 XP gained after completing a quest doesn't feel rewarding, it feels almost insulting. Being overleveled makes combat boring, so most players will find they're forced to turn the difficulty up once they're in this situation. And this also means fighting enemies and completing points of interest provides no meaningful XP reward, 
making them feel pointless as a result. This is bad design that could easily be avoided by simply reducing the amount of XP for quests in general and making XP rewards scale proportionally to the player's level. But hey, there's more to life than experience points and more to RPG progression than levels. There's also loot and money. Loot in-game sucks. Outside the early portions of your playthrough, the best gear available is always the crafted Witcher gear. Both quest rewards and items found in the game world are always scaled below your level, and so they are nearly always worse. This even applies to the supposedly important items you get through the main questline. Not I. King Erland uncrated. Erland Stonefist? So this is Winter's Blade. Thought it was a legend. Forged in Mahakam, tempered in dragon fire. Been in the Uncrate family for centuries. And now, it's yours. And it's only level 22. It's complete trash. But swords and armor aren't everything. What about the other stuff you loot? And you will loot other stuff. Over and over and over again. Well, the good thing about other loot is most items don't have a weight, so you can loot everything freely and not have to worry about getting over encumbered. In fact, in one 100 hour playthrough of The Witcher 3, I was over encumbered a lot less than in a 25 hour Witcher 2 playthrough, so that's an improvement. Most items you loot are useless though, although the game is clever at giving the impression that that's not the case. Different items have different colours that make them at least look valuable, and you will loot plenty of blueprints and formulas that do seem to have theoretical value, until you realise how useless non-witcher gear is, and how regularly you pick up the same blueprints and recipes over and over again. You do find a few useful items, like Alkahest, lesser red mutagens, repair kits, glyphs, etc. But the process of looting areas and gaining items is still pretty boring. The main progression system is crafting, and it's handled well enough. Most things you need can be easily bought, but there's usually one or two items per recipe that come from specific enemies, and act as a gating mechanism. You'll probably find these items automatically as you progress through the game, but the process of continually checking and improving your blade oils and potions, as well as that all-important witcher gear, is reasonably satisfying even if it's nothing special. Money is the final reward system, and it's also not great. You get some money from completing quests, as well as selling items you loot. Money is useful, but the problem is it never feels useful. There is nothing interesting to buy, as all the good stuff comes from crafting. That doesn't mean money is useless, as crafting can be quite expensive. Every step of the crafting process has small costs, and they can add up if you haven't been bothered to sell much loot or do many side activities. But money doesn't feel useful, as you're unlikely to pay much attention to crafting costs. You'll likely just accept and ignore them, and you're never in a situation where there's an expensive item and you feel a desire to save up for it, or to come back later once you have more money. You use money in The Witcher 3 to pay your adventuring bills of crafting costs and repairing, not to go on adventuring shopping trips to buy interesting stuff, which means that money always feels boring and valueless. Neither XP, loot, nor money feels rewarding, and so the in-game progression systems that are a feature of most RPGs fall flat in The Witcher 3. The skill system is a slight improvement on the previous games, however. There is a decent amount of choice, although those choices are fairly small and don't allow for many radically different playstyles. The way equipable skills synergize with each other, and with equipped mutagens, is nice. At least it is once you've unlocked more slots later in the game and have a bit more freedom. Despite this, the character advancement and progression is overall fairly weak in The Witcher 3, and if you play RPGs because you enjoy levelling up and gaining nice loot, the game has little to offer you. The last reason for why this is a shallow role-playing game is how quests play out. The Witcher 3 holds the player's hand heavily in its quest design. You may wonder what that has to do with being an RPG, so let me expand on this a bit. When playing traditional role-playing games, e.g. pen and paper, the most defining characteristic isn't that you get to play the role of some other character. It's that you get the freedom to tackle problems the way you want to. You're only as limited in your actions as your imagination. Or so they say. But that's where the magic comes from. 
It results in collaborative storytelling where you have a huge amount of freedom, and that's what makes it enjoyable. Role-playing video games have long tried to emulate that aspect of traditional role-playing games, and obviously their ability to do so is severely limited due to the more restrictive nature of the medium. Requiring the player to think about their actions should be an important part of an RPG. This can be done by giving them choice in conversations, as The Witcher 3 does, but it should also be a part of completing quests. Quests should feature multiple solutions or require at least some problem solving on the player's behalf. The Witcher 3 does have examples where these apply, but they happen far too rarely. Implementing multiple solutions to quests can be difficult, and in a game the size of The Witcher 3 it's somewhat understandable why this isn't always possible. But it was done a lot better in The Witcher 1 and 2. However, creating quests that require so little problem solving is inexcusable. You will spend a lot of time in The Witcher 3 doing detective work, and almost none of it involves the player. Time and time again, all it amounts to is hold down the Witcher Sense button, press A to interact with things highlighted in red, sometimes follow bright red markers, and let Geralt do all the thinking for you. Most of the time, the highlighted objects are made so obvious it's almost insulting. Take this example in the quest The Tower Full of Mice. Hmm, what could this mean? Oh no, what am I supposed to do? Maybe use the lever? with the bright red handprint next to it. Wow, I worked that out all by myself. So, finding clues is incredibly easy, but what about what you do with them? That's the real detective work anyway, right? Well, there are two quests in the entire game where the player's skills of deduction are brought into question in a meaningful way. Tower Full of Mice and Carnal Sins. I'll talk about them later when I get to quests, but while in neither quest the detective work is implemented especially well, they do still both stand as some of the best quests in the game, and part of that is because the player is asked to actually think, and there are possible consequences for not doing so. I'm not advocating for things to always be difficult to find, or for complex puzzles in each quest, just for quests to require a small amount of thought from the player. I don't mind if a game holds my hand a bit, but in The Witcher 3 it's often excessive. Compare the autopsy in The Witcher 1. There are several things you can do to prepare yourself that affect how the quest plays out, like reading books or talking to other people. There's also multiple outcomes, and working out the cause of death does require the player to think a bit. It's not perfect, but working it out for yourself felt really good, it made me feel like a detective. But it's not just that quest, there are other examples too. Take when you need to find a virgin's tear in The Witcher 1 during the side quest Beauty and the Beast. There are no quest markers and the game doesn't tell you who to go to ask, you have to work it out. There's multiple sources, one of which is Siegfried and asking him leads to a nice moment and a satisfying feeling for the player as having worked something out for themselves. And there are certain examples from The Witcher 2, or from many many other older RPGs. An RPG should make you feel like the role you're playing. If part of the role of a witcher is being a detective, then the player should get to feel like a detective sometimes. Not just feel like a spectator watching Geralt be a detective. It's worse than that though. Almost all detective work involves using your witcher senses, interacting with red things, and letting Geralt do everything else. It's usually linear, requires zero effort or engagement from the player, and is impossible to fail. This isn't just bad role-playing design, it's bad game design. It's boring. Quests make up for this in other areas, but gameplay-wise, they are boring. I suppose at least listening to Geralt do his thing can be nice. I mean, questing in RPGs can get lonely, and Geralt's commentary can be nice to listen to, but gameplay matters in games, and this is bad gameplay. Some people may not agree with this. They may prefer detective work to be easy and mostly automated, Maybe they play the game for the combat and the story, and that is a perfectly valid perspective. Something I've heard mentioned in regards to the Uncharted series is the need for a difficulty setting outside of combat, as no matter what difficulty setting you play Uncharted on, the puzzles and platforming remains easy. And this idea is actually being implemented in the new Tomb Raider game, and time will tell how that works out, but this is something I wish The Witcher 3 had. The game would have to be designed slightly differently, but the Witcher senses could be toned down, 
Objective markers could be slightly vaguer, and quests could feature more dialogue choices that aren't always correct. And all of this could be controlled by a separate difficulty option, so those who wouldn't enjoy these changes could be unaffected. I'm sure this would require a reasonable amount of work to implement, but I think it would be worth it for many players. As it stands, there are good reasons to criticise the roleplaying in The Witcher 3, and there are areas I hope Seda Project improves on in the future. But The Witcher 3 doesn't deserve the title of best RPG ever made, because so many other RPGs do roleplaying better. The Witcher 3's combat is a surprisingly contentious topic. I don't agree with those who say this game has bad combat. It's functional, looks good, and is an improvement on the previous games in the series. As far as action RPGs go, I'd even say The Witcher 3 has better combat than average, although that average is admittedly lower than it perhaps should be. Anyway, The Witcher 3 has great combat animations, with plenty of visceral kill sequences, and visually there's good monster variety. There is one main problem with it, and a few smaller problems I want to also mention. The big problem is the lack of choice when in combat. Choice in combat is an undervalued part of what makes combat enjoyable. Players should be regularly choosing between whether to attack, move or dodge, what attack to do, which enemy to attack, when to use special abilities, and so on. Reaction times and executing complicated button inputs are usually a smaller part of success than making the correct choices to overcome the current situation. The Witcher 3 does give the player many options, however it doesn't utilise these in interesting ways. Instead there is a one style fits all approach to combat and that understandably gets boring in such a long game. Let's look at what options you have. Firstly you have two types of attacks, fast and strong. Ideally, in a game with two types of attack, each would be better in different scenarios, with the strong attack being higher risk because it's slow, but higher rewards as it does more damage. Initially in The Witcher 3, the fast attack is far better, as the damage difference between them is minimal, so there's no reason to use your strong attack. The real problem is that the upgrade system heavily encourages you to upgrade only one style, as upgrading both is too expensive and pretty pointless. So, almost all players will pick one type and then only use that attack. As the fast attack is initially far better for most, it will likely be fast attacks they choose, and then they will play the whole game only using the fast attack. Upgrading the strong attack does actually lead to the two attack types being more balanced, and in combat you'll probably find yourself using a mix between fast and strong attacks, as strong attacks will then do great damage, but are still too slow for some situations. This makes combat more enjoyable, but it's an objectively worse way to play than just upgrading the fast attack. Because despite the upgraded strong attack's good damage, using only your fast attack works in every situation and still does good enough damage while making the game considerably easier. The Witcher 3 should have made strong attacks do more damage initially so they feel worth using, while also changing the upgrade system so it no longer forces player to favour one attack type. And lastly, certain monsters should be weak to each type of attack, as this was established by the series previously and adds more variety to combat. Movement in combat also provides multiple options. To the game's credit, Geralt has a lot of weight to his movement in combat now, which is an improvement on the last game which had a huge problem with Geralt's weightlessness. There's also two different dodge options the small dodge and the roll. The small dodge is far more useful however, with only a few enemy attacks requiring you to roll to avoid them, like the earth elemental's ground pound attack, and these same attacks can usually be avoided by doing two small dodges anyway instead. However, the bigger problem with dodging is it's incredibly easy. You dodge instantly upon pressing the button, even if you're mid-attack animation. This is different to some other action games, like the series that everyone wants to compare every game's combat to these days. In that game, you can only dodge once your attack animation is completed, and that means attacking carries a certain level of risk. That's not the case in The Witcher 3 though. You can dodge any time, so there is never actual risk to attacking. The advantage of this is it makes combat fluid, and that may be appropriate to a Witcher's combat style, but it does mean there is never a need to choose between whether to attack or dodge, as you can always dodge whenever you need to if you react in time. This also means that enemies haven't been given very big wind-ups to their attack animations, and so the process of watching for the start of enemies' attack animation to be able to dodge successfully doesn't happen much in The Witcher 3. Dodging is less about watching enemies carefully, and more a test of your reactions, 
and the process is overall too easy and repetitive. Next up is signs. Signs are a fun concept, and changing between them is quicker and feels a lot better than in The Witcher 2. It seems like Seda Project have got a bit better at designing a controller-friendly UI in this game, as menus are also generally better designed than in The Witcher 2. However, signs also don't present much choice, as there is little reason to change them much or experiment. Just like with fast and strong attacks, the upgrade system encourages you to pick one and focus on that, which once more is counterintuitive to creating choice and variety in combat. There is also the problem of Quen. Quen is overpowered. Very overpowered. Other signs can be very strong once upgraded, but Quen needs no upgrading. It takes no skill to use effectively either, you can just use it at the start of a fight and refresh it anytime you take damage. It activates near instantly as well. Brainlessly spamming Quen as needed is incredibly effective in challenging fights. In my latest playthrough I wasn't using Quen to make the game more interesting, but still at times I got stuck on a fight like against this ice elemental 10 levels higher than me. This is on death march. After several deaths I gave up and used Quen, and the fight was a complete breeze. What's so annoying about Quen being overpowered is the exact same problem existed in The Witcher 2, for the same reasons, and the developers didn't learn from that and change or tone down Quen to fix the issue. Anyway, signs aren't the only tool witches have at their disposal. There's several other things, but none add much and each have their own problems. Oils are useful, but their implementation is really annoying. You can apply them in combat, and so if you use oils regularly you'll find yourself pausing the game at the start of each fight to go through some menus to apply some blade oil. It's slow and boring and kills the pace of fights. Oils can be very effective once upgraded, but using them is still annoying. Maybe they were meant to encourage players to learn about their foes, so they know which type of oil to use, but all you need to do to check an enemy type is open the bestiary. This may waste more of the player's time, but it doesn't add challenge in any way or make oils interesting. And so oils don't add choice in combat beyond the choice of whether you can be bothered to go to the effort of traversing through menus to apply them each fight. Then there's potions. You can apply them in combat, so the problems of the Witcher 2 system are gone. The downside is there's little reason to use many different types of potions as you only have a few quick slots. You'll probably find yourself using Swallow plus one other type and ignoring the rest throughout the game. Potion usage is completely instant with no animation, so there's no need to be careful or aware of your position to find a good time to use them. They're always just a button press away. So there's not much choice in which potions to use and also little choice involved in using them in combat. Decoctions are similar to potions but with a bigger range of effects, and again, there is little incentive to experiment and use a variety of them due to few quick slots, and some of them being both powerful and universally useful. So you'll probably pick one or two if you went for an alchemy build, and then stick with them throughout the game, which is again boring. The crossbow exists, but its main role seems to be an anti-air gun. There's also bombs, but they don't add much, although there are definitely a few interesting ones that can at least be fun to utilise. So The Witcher 3 gives you a large range of tools to play with, but it gives you very little reason to utilise those tools beyond discovering a single approach that works for you, and then just sticking with that approach. And I've heard of some players not even doing that much, and just ignoring things like oils and decoctions completely for the entire playthrough, which is easy enough to do on most difficulties. Because the game is so goddamn huge, with so much content, the fact that fights play out the same way over and over again, with a single tactic being all you need, means combat will get boring eventually. Enemy variety doesn't help. There are many different types of enemies, and they look great, but fighting them can be very similar. Outside of wraiths, most enemies are either of the big and slow type, or the small and quick, and they don't feel very diverse when you actually fight them. There's not much difference between, say, a Drowner and a Necker, or a Siren and a Harpy. And the most boring enemy type is unfortunately also the most common, humans. More variety in human enemies would have been nice. The two-handed hammer guys are a good addition, but shield enemies and enemies that block a lot just feel like they slow fights down, and in general fighting humans gets old quick. When it comes to monsters, the bestiary shows a really impressive amount of enemy weaknesses, but utilising those weaknesses makes very little difference. Yarden is great against wraiths and Axie is great against Algols, but most of the listed weaknesses matter very little. 
fast attacks, dodging and quen just so happen to be great against almost everything. So there's little reason to care about weaknesses and little reason to try and change your strategy depending on your opponent. Enemy specific weaknesses were always an important part of the series and I wish they were more important here. The way in which knowledge of enemy weaknesses is given to the player has also changed. In the previous games, weaknesses were in the bestiary, but the player had to earn that knowledge, either through reading in-game books or killing a certain amount of enemies. In The Witcher 3, all you have to do is kill an enemy once, and all information is then unlocked, which is too easy. Unlocking enemy weaknesses could have been part of an additional progression system. Killing enemies of a certain type could have led to unlocking weaknesses and stat boosts against those enemies, making combat more rewarding despite the small amount of XP it currently gives. While we're on the subject of hypothetical changes and things the earlier Witcher games did better, I miss having to prepare for fights. Having played the previous games, the concept of preparing for fights beforehand feels like a very important part of playing as a Witcher. Knowing your enemy has been built up as a big part of how Witchers slay monsters. Its execution in previous games had its problems, but I wish there was more to it in The Witcher 3. In every Witcher contract in this game, you're actually told what you'll fight before you encounter the monster, as if the game is specifically letting you know to prepare yourself, but there isn't much you can actually do to prepare. You can still meditate, but the only reason to do so is to refresh your potions. The auto-refill of potions is a smart idea, both as a time saver and as a nice bit of psychological encouragement to get players to use their consumables rather than hoard them. There's no other reason to meditate before fights though. I wish the meditation screen was where you applied blade oils and that their limited charges were removed, as applying them in combat feels bad and gets very tedious. So instead you'd choose which blade oils to use when meditating and then they would stay in effect until you meditate again. Decoctions could work the same way, there are too few quick slots for them anyway, and that would at least encourage players to use a greater variety and choose a specific decoction to fit the upcoming fight. Small changes like this would go a long way to capturing the feeling of playing as a Witcher, where knowledge of enemies and careful preparation are meant to be vital for success. To reiterate though, I'm not saying combat is bad. It does the job, looks good, and does offer some enjoyment. It may even receive less criticism if the game wasn't so long, but the large amount of content in the game makes the flaws in the combat system more noticeable. The lack of variety and depth can make it repetitive, as each fight does play out very similarly most of the time. In the end, combat still feels good enough for most players, and luckily, there's a lot more that this game has to offer to make up for the weak gameplay. Before moving on to look at what makes this game good, there are a few smaller criticisms that may not be hugely important but that I really feel I need to get off my chest. Because after playing free playthroughs, some of the smaller things have started to really annoy me, and I feel they need to at least be mentioned. Like the repeating character models. I get it, it's a big game and it's bound to happen, but did they really need to have two guys with the exact same model standing next to each other in this scene? And then there's this model. If they were going to reuse this model so much, could they at least have made the kid look a little less... Weird. They say Harry's dim, but that just ain't true. Harry don't know how to plough or sew, nor catch no fishes, but he sure can play cards. Harry can shut the fuck up. I'm sick of seeing your smug face everywhere. And then there's this effect, which I guess is meant to simulate the wind and make it look like each character's hair's blowing. But it always happens, even indoors where there's no wind. Why is Geralt's hair always moving like this? It's so noticeable and distracting. And then there's the beard. The glorious beard that grows in real time, exemplifying the pinnacle of gaming technology. Clearly, the most important feature of the game, which justified the huge focus gaming journalists placed on it in their pre-release coverage. And it constantly clips through any collared outfit you wear. And I mean constantly. And there are bugs in this game still. Many, many bugs which you would expect for a game this size, but I have no idea why some people act as if this game is uniquely bug-free compared to certain other RPGs, when it's just not. Okay, back to more important topics. I want to talk about the story, characters and setting together, as they're all linked. Before that though, there are a few other things I want to discuss that are both important and deserving of recognition. There are other things worthy of praise that I won't be covering because I think they speak for themselves. Things like the graphics, the soundtrack or Gwent. 
These are important aspects of a game, but the reason they're good are pretty obvious, and I'd rather talk about aspects that may be more underappreciated. The first of these is dialogue. I've heard an estimate from a Seto Project developer that The Witcher 3 has 35 hours of content that is pure dialogue, but that number seems a somewhat conservative estimate to me. Regardless, you will spend a lot of time in conversations in this game. Listening to conversations is an activity that can get boring in video games. It's passive, and we play games to play them, not just sit and watch. Some games try to get around this by creating walking and talking sections, in the hope that the activity of walking is enough to make players feel engaged. Another way to engage the player is by giving them choices in conversations, to actively involve them in dialogue and to allow them at least some opportunities to shape how things play out. This is what happens in The Witcher 3, and it's a big part of how a game with 35 hours of dialogue prevents those sections from feeling boring. There's regular choice in conversations, which succeeds at engaging the player in what's going on. These choices may change a few lines of dialogue, but often they have no further consequences than that. They create a small space for role-playing, but it's a space that's quite constrained, and you'd be surprised when you listen to both options of a presented choice, how consistently both options feel like they fit Geralt and lead to similar outcomes. Choice in conversation hasn't been designed with facilitating role-playing as its main priority, as is the case in some other RPGs that tend to feature more dialogue options that can be much more varied than those presented in The Witcher 3. Instead, The Witcher 3's dialogue has been designed to be good, and it succeeds. It is well written. Maybe not in a literary sense, but dialogue is surprisingly enjoyable. Conversations also flow perfectly. Even when you have choices that expand on topics, conversations still never fall into that unnatural territory of other RPGs where conversations stop feeling like real conversations. They always feel real and sound natural, even when you're presented with multiple choices. They also allow for a great amount of personality to come through from the various characters you encounter. Even throwaway NPCs tend to feel well realised. Dialogue is full of witty banter and memorable lines, it feels worth hearing. Even without considering the impressiveness of the sheer quantity of dialogue in the game, the overall level of quality is really high. And it's not just because of the writing. The presentation in conversations is just as good. There's a large range of camera angles, with lingering shots, close-ups, and nice framing. There's loads of animations that don't just seem like stock animations we see repeated regularly, but feel handcrafted to fit what's happening. And then there are the faces. How did we come so far? This was 2007, and it's only been eight years. There's such a range of realistically depicted emotions shown on the characters' faces now, and almost no jankiness. And this isn't a 10 hour game, it's a 100 hour game with 35 plus hours of pure dialogue, which makes this consistent level of high quality very impressive. There's a reason not every game has been able to pull such a feat off. Sorry, my face is tired from dealing with everything. The small details help make dialogue so good, but small details are important in many other places in The Witcher 3. The small details in this game play a huge part in making it what it is, and there are so, so many I could talk about to illustrate this. There are many examples of environmental detail, which both help bring these landscapes to life and reinforce aspects of the story, but that's something most people will notice themselves. If there's one thing I'd really like to highlight, it's how many really well hidden details there are in this game that players might not notice. I can only show a tiny fraction of what there is, and so to prove just how extensive these details are, and to share something worth sharing, I want to take a minute to show you this PDF, created by Andreas Schmeidhofer, with the help of a Witcher 3 Facebook group. It's a 160 page PDF showing the most hidden details in the game, and there's a link in the description if you want to check it out. If you're like me, You'll find it a fun read, although I'd recommend reading it only after having replayed the game at least once, because finding these small details yourself on subsequent playthroughs can be great. In fact, after my first playthrough of the game I was pleasantly surprised when going through the game a second time with how much I'd missed, but after two thorough playthroughs I thought I'd seen pretty much everything. The fact that on my third playthrough there were still plenty of surprises was pretty amazing. I'll give just a couple of examples that aren't quite so well known amongst fans to show what I mean. You first meet the mage Moritz at the Vigal Bud's Ball, where he'll look down on Triss's offer to help him escape the city. However, you can meet him again later. 
outside the glory gate of Novigrad, where he's been captured by witch hunters and is being burned alive on a pyre. That's not all though, you can actually use Ard to extinguish the fire and, after killing the witch hunters, you can actually save him. If you do this before Triss's next quest, now or never, he'll even be there during the escape. And this is all incredibly easy to miss. Another great example is during the first flashback of Ciri, where you meet the little girl in Velen. Here you investigate a corpse to determine what beast is ahead, but if you try to rush through this investigation, Ciri gets it wrong, and incorrectly concludes the wounds are caused by a fiend instead of a werewolf. And this results in her creating the wrong type of oil and being disadvantaged in the upcoming fight. This example is so great because this is just the kind of thing you might do if you're replaying the game and assuming you don't need to do the whole investigation as you've seen it before. And then the fact that the game reacts to this makes for one hell of a surprise. It's a great thing to find organically. Finding these things adds a lot to the replay value and creates some really memorable moments, but it also shows just how much care went into making The Witcher 3. A lot of these examples are not things most players would notice. They didn't need to be included in the game, and there isn't much reason to include content most players won't see. But they were included nevertheless, just so that people who did replay the games or search every corner of this world were rewarded, and they do make the world feel more real and more interesting. Small details that are well hidden are effective because of players' expectations. Whether that's the expectation that the game would not feature so much reactivity to a seemingly insignificant detail, or the expectation that having played the game once you've seen everything already. Expectations and uncertainty play a much larger part in The Witcher 3's narrative success than this though. The use of expectations and uncertainty are central to the game's quest design and its storytelling success. Firstly, let's look at choice and consequence in game. There are four big decisions you'll make that affect the ending slides, but there's far more smaller sections of choice and consequence throughout The Witcher 3. However, there's far, far more times when you're given a choice in a conversation that has no real consequences at all. The thing is, you as the player don't know when your choice will have no consequences, when it will have small consequences, or when it will have huge consequences. The fact that some choices do matter is enough to make all choices seem like they matter, because you know these choices could potentially be important and you have no way of knowing when they won't be. When you're told to bow before the Emperor of Nilfgaard and you have to decide whether to do so or not, you don't know this doesn't have any further consequences, so you still have to weigh your decision carefully. Of course, this could be said about other games featuring choice and consequence, and that's true. The same rules apply. But The Witcher 3 deliberately takes this further. To illustrate this, let's look at three examples of decisions you make during the first section of the game in Valen. The first example is in the main questline during the Nilfgaardian Connection, where you go to the inn at the crossroads and run into the Bloody Baron's men who try to pick a fight with Geralt. If you give them their wish, you'll kill them and later in the quest Bloody Baron, you'll then not be allowed into the keep by the guards and have to find an alternative way inside. If you manage to de-escalate the situation at the inn and leave the Baron's men in peace, you'll instead be allowed entry to Crow's Perch during this quest, with the guards mentioning your previous actions. This early example shows the player how seemingly small actions earlier in the game can have bigger consequences later on. The next example is from the fantastically atmospheric and witcheresque side quest, A Tower Full of Mice, where you investigate the ghostly tower on Fike Isle. At the end of this quest, you meet the ghost Annabella, who had died in truly tragic and really disturbing circumstances. You can then agree to help her by taking her bones to her lover. Doing so reveals she's a plague maiden. She kills her lover and is set free in the world to spread plague as she pleases. The player is left feeling like they have fucked up. Big time. Of course, there is a choice. You can refuse her request, and there are a couple of small clues earlier that she can't be trusted, like when Geralt questions her for changing her story. It's enough for you to see something's wrong if you replay the quest, or to look back at and kick yourself for not realising the first time. But it's not enough to lead most players to the better outcome because the choice itself is presented in quite a misleading way. It's deliberately made to not look like a choice. And there's only one yellow option given to the player here, and the good choice simply looks like it's for not advancing the quest yet. And if somehow you get the better ending on your first time doing the quest, it still doesn't seem like a good ending because the ghost's lover still dies. 
It's a tragic quest that is designed to make the player mess up and feel responsible. It teaches the player how your actions can cause bad things to happen if you're not very careful. The third example is the ending of Ladies of the Wood, where the player has to decide whether to release or kill the spirit in the Whispering Hillock. You are asked who you trust more, the spirit or the crones of Crookback Bog, neither of which seem trustworthy and each hint that opposing them could have negative consequences. And there are, for both options. It doesn't matter which you help, someone innocent will die as a result. If you free the spirit, it will kill most of the inhabitants of Down Warren, which is something it's hard for the player not to feel personally responsible for. The Baron's wife will also die, and finally the Baron will take his own life as a result of your choice. If you instead kill the spirit, the crones will take the lives of the children in the bog, and the revelation when you next see them is one of the game's best moments. That moment where their disgusting true form is revealed, and you realise the spirit was right about them. It's really well done. The character designs are incredible, and really drive home the fate of the children. With the bloody, child-sized arm sticking out of one's apron, or the cooking accessories carried by another. It's genuinely horrific to think that you've doomed these kids to this fate. This part is so effective. It's so good, I'll have to come back to it later. Anyway, you're given a choice in this quest, and both options have bad outcomes. Very bad outcomes that are designed to make the player feel guilty, and teach the player not only do your choices matter, but sometimes there is no good option. That it doesn't matter what you do, you can't avoid bad outcomes. It's a harsh lesson for the player to learn. Not only do your choices matter, but this game is also willing to take moral greyness to an extreme, and to force you to have blood on your hands, even going as far as to trick you in the tower full of mice to make sure you fail. Oh, you wanted a happy ending, did you? Well, fuck you. Welcome to the real world. There aren't always happy endings, people don't get what they deserve, and things don't always work out. Oh, what's that? Player choice is supposed to empower the player, you say? Things are meant to be fair? Wrong. This game isn't trying to empower the player or create the deepest role-playing experience out there. It's trying to tell a story. Choice and consequence is used like seasoning. It does its job by adding to the experience and there's just enough so the player can always taste it. So you don't forget it's there, so things don't feel bland. And it's not designed to be fair. Let me talk about another example. There are two minor side quests that maybe you aren't familiar with. The first is At the Mercy of Strangers. In Velen, you can find a man tied up next to a river, having been left there to be killed by drowners. If you save him, you can meet him again later at a former refugee camp, where he and some other bandits have killed and robbed the refugees. Well, perhaps you shouldn't have freed him, you might think to yourself. In another quest, Crime and Punishment, you will find a man named Jorg, chained to the rock at the edge of the sea in Skellige. This is a formal punishment in Skellige reserved for the most serious of criminals. Just as in the previous quest, he'll tell you he's innocent and you have a chance to save him. After this scene, you can come across a funeral in the village of Rogna, where you can meet Jorg's younger sister, who will tell you the truth of what happened. She had lied that her uncle, who she didn't like, had molested her, and in retaliation Jorg had confronted and killed him in a fit of rage. Suddenly, Jorg being chained to a rock and eaten alive by Harpy seems quite tragic. But you didn't leave him there, right? You didn't think, after completing the previous quest at the Mercy of Strangers, that maybe you shouldn't trust people left to die, and therefore decide that this time you won't make the same mistake twice? You didn't think you could outsmart the game by learning from your previous blunder, did you? Well, if you did, all I can say is, welcome to the world of The Witcher. There's no cosmic rule to the universe making sure everyone gets what they deserve, even for you, the player. And both the world and quest design are made more interesting as a result. But enough on choice and consequence, we also need to look at the stories these quests tell, and how they utilise player expectation. It's no secret that the subversion of tropes and fairy tales is a big part of the Witcher series. It's what a Witcher is. A cynical take on the monster slayers seen in storybooks. A role usually played by chivalrous knights or destined orphans is instead reimagined as ruthless professionals designed for the job that are not loved and adored by the public as a result of their monster slaying, but are instead hated and feared. 
There are countless examples of how The Witcher 3 pays homage to various folklore and fairy tales, and also how it subverts elements of them and of the fantasy genre. So we have Snow White references, a twisted take on Hansel and Gretel, and inspiration taken from Polish legends, and so on. However, even outside the more obvious examples, there is a sense that almost every quest was designed to not feel narratively straightforward. There's always some twist, or some reveal. That the monster isn't that much of a monster, or the innocent aren't quite so innocent. And that's great. It's a big factor in making quests entertaining. It's very rare for a side quest to feel like just another fetch quest or like filler. They each seem to have a story worth hearing, and that consistent level of quality to the stories they tell is something that often gets praised. However, some quests will even use your expectations of a twist against you. Let's look at the side quest, The Black Pearl. It seems a simple quest, where a man enlists Geralt's help to help him find a black pearl in Skellige, so he can give it to his wife. The way in which Geralt is given the only difficult task, diving down to actually get the pearl, and then has to save the man from drowners, makes it seem like Geralt is being taken advantage of, and that the man is incompetent or untrustworthy. When you're told you have to wait until you return to Novigrad for your reward, you might start to get suspicious. There's been no twist so far, so one must be coming. You think to yourself, I bet he's not going to pay you, or that his wife will call him an idiot and the whole thing will be revealed to be pointless. And then you go see him, but neither of those things happen. Instead, he tells you the sad tale of how his wife has been losing her memory and doesn't even recognise her husband anymore. The Black Pearl was part of a promise made in earlier years that the man hoped might jog her memory and reverse her condition. Of course it won't, but you certainly can't blame the man for trying. It's sad, and it hits you hard because moments earlier you were expecting something completely different would happen, and maybe expecting the worst from this guy. Your expectations were used against you to make the story more impactful. It's clever storytelling and it turns a simple quest that had felt like a bit of a time waste into something quite moving and memorable. For another great example, let's return to the quest Ladies of the Woods and the lovely Crookback Bog. If you played The Witcher 1 and 2, you may have certain expectations on romance and sex in game. And to be fair, the last time you met a witch in some backwater area, things did play out somewhat differently. So when you see the ladies of the woods on their tapestry and they look a certain way and act flirtatious with the player, I bet some people's minds may have started to wonder if this quest might end somewhat differently. In fact, just before you do meet them, you even hear moans. And then you do actually meet them, and if you had been hoping for some wild witch orgy, I bet you're regretting that wish. And their sexuality is played up in this scene. They continue to flirt with you, they make suggestive gestures, and it's revolting. But it's all the more so if you went into this expecting things to be different. Subversion of player expectations is great, but sometimes entire quests can be much more or less than the player expects. Quests aren't always neatly structured the way the player would expect them to be, and as a result, you can never be quite sure what they're going to offer or where you'll end up. I'll provide both an example of a disappointingly short quest and a surprisingly long one to explain what I mean. Firstly, there's the quest Fencing Lessons, where Geralt agrees to help Rosa Varatra with her sword play after you meet her in the main quest when searching for Dandelion. Because you find this quest through the main quest, you might expect something quite interesting and substantial from it. After all, for many of the biggest and most impressive side quests, they are connected to the main story, or the characters you meet during the story, so the player is less likely to miss these bigger quests. And you may also develop certain expectations upon seeing the two attractive identical twins. Even if you aren't expecting to sleep with them, you may think you're in for some fun mistaken identity hijinks at the very least. But the quest doesn't play out that way at all. After duelling her, Rosa runs off, encounters some drunks who you then have to deal with, and afterwards Geralt will scold her for being naive and she'll leave, never to be heard from again. For many players, it's a complete letdown, and maybe this quest is the way it is as a result of cut content, but the result creates an almost jarring ending where the player's expectations were completely not met, and I like that. Deliberate or not, the feeling that not every quest delivers on its promise is interesting. 
Disappointment is a common part of life, and the fact that some quests fail to deliver is realistic. Of course, thinking that way is easy in a game full of quality side quests. I doubt I'd feel the same way if a large number of quests felt unfinished and underwhelming, but when it's only occasional it leaves an interesting impression. But there are a couple of great examples of the complete opposite happening, of expectations being far surpassed, and of simple quests leading somewhere truly surprising. My favourite of which comes from the Witcher contract, The Phantom of Eldberg. It's a standard Witcher contract where you investigate a haunted lighthouse, kill some wraiths, and discover the lighthouse keeper has a secret, and is a very naughty boy. However, during the quest Geralt meets a couple of locals who dislike outsiders, and one thing leads to another and you end up in a fist fight that becomes something more, and ends with all participants except Geralt being killed. On leaving the tavern the other villagers confront you and you end up being arrested and taken to the prison of the Jarl, Madman Lugos. This begins the quest Stranger in a Strange Land, and it's a fantastic moment as you were just doing a normal Witcher contract. By this point you'll have realised Witcher contracts are the more formulaic and less important type of side quests, so your expectations are set deliberately quite low. The way you end up in jail is also great at showing the player what life for a Witcher can be like, how things can go wrong even when you're only trying to help. And when in jail, you're already caught off guard, so you'll be wondering what the hell will happen next. It turns out you can escape fairly easily, and this leads to another side quest, Cave of Dreams, which is great in its own right with some really memorable dialogue and scenes. There's even a fourth quest, An Unpaid Debt, which you can also do if you escape the jail with the help of one of the prisoners. And it all started with a simple Witcher contract. It's a terrific quest chain that not only offers a big surprise, but does a great job at showing the player what life on Skellige and life as a Witcher can be like. This can all be quite easy to miss for the player, as there's limited time to trigger it due to story events. But still, the developers decided it's worth taking the risk that players may miss this sequence in order to tell the story they want to more effectively, which is great. Another example of something similar is when helping Dandelion in the quest Cabaret, which ends with Priscilla being attacked, starting the very memorable side quest Carnal Sins, where you investigate the attack and hunt a serial killer in Novigrad. Cabaret seems an upbeat quest that features humour and it ends in this very dark and personal manner. Priscilla's attacker has injured her throat by making her ingest acid, and after the earlier scene where you listen to her sing, it's hard not to feel angry and personally involved in Carnal Sin's outcome, and that outcome can also lead to disappointment if you fail to get the right killer. And while that choice isn't handled perfectly, this whole questline really shows you how quests can lead to surprises and disappointments, how choices aren't fair, and how consequences aren't always what you predict. The result of all these things I've mentioned in this section is that quests feel both more interesting, as you aren't sure what to expect, but also more realistic, as there is a sense that anything can happen and that quests won't always follow the rules you'd expect of them. Suffice to say, this game's great quests, and the stories they tell, are a hugely important part of why this game is so loved. But they're not the only reason. In this final section of the video, I want to talk about the main story, setting, and characters. At the start of this video I said the main story wasn't amazing, and I stand by that. I want to talk about its problems, but I also want to talk about the things it gets right, which there is quite a lot of. So let's start at the beginning. The opening of the game takes place in a dream where we see Kaer Morhen, which looks both similar and a whole lot more impressive than it was in The Witcher 1. This section does a fantastic job at introducing the player to the major characters that they may not be familiar with. We meet Yennefer, Vesemir and Ciri, and with just a few lines of dialogue the game establishes their characters and their relationship to Geralt. This is important to make the events of the game feel meaningful, particularly for Yen and Ciri as you'll hear about them quite a lot before actually meeting them. The dream sequence ends with an introduction to something else important, the main antagonists of the game, the Wild Hunt. Following this the game begins in White Orchard, which acts as a tutorial section to introduce players both to the open world and the role of witches as professional monster slayers. You hunt a griffin, and in typical witcher fashion things go wrong and a fight breaks out between Geralt and the locals, which serves as a nice introduction to that other part of witcher life, the dislike and prejudice directed at them by others. Nevertheless, you do soon find Yen. Kind of. In fact, she actually finds you, which is a nice surprise and subverts the usual video game trope of having to be the one to go find other people all the time. 
The dialogue here is also really good, and this is a great moment if you already know her character and spent the whole of The Witcher 1 and 2 patiently waiting for her to show up. It does feel like your patience has finally been rewarded. You go meet Amir, who has a fantastic voice actor in Charles Dance, but ends up feeling like a character who is a bit underutilised. But at least for the scenes he is in, he has a great amount of presence. Next, you'll arrive in Velen. And the moment when you open your map and come to terms with just how big this game is, is pretty great. Looking for Ciri makes for a good main quest, as it feels immediately personal. You're not on a quest to save the world, initially at least, and that makes for a nice change in an RPG. Still, a main quest line where you're simply looking for someone would get boring if the stories told along the way weren't interesting, but luckily, they are. I don't want to talk about the Bloody Baron too much, as so many other people have done that already, but I do want to at least touch on this section. I've talked earlier about the importance of expectations, and the Bloody Baron is no different. From his name, and what you hear about his character, the player will expect something quite different from what you find. You'll likely imagine him as a tyrant, and someone who'll oppose you, but in fact, he's a tragic figure and instead helps you. It's also interesting how much you can learn about him from overhearing NPCs chatter to themselves. Both his alcohol problem and family issues are talked about, and you can even learn the real reason for his title of Bloody Baron before he tells you himself. Anyway, his characterization is truly excellent. The way in which the writers handle difficult topics, like domestic abuse, abortion and alcoholism, is both nuanced and realistic, which feels like a very impressive achievement. Learning about him and his problems makes for a great story that isn't at all what you probably expected. By the end of it, it's hard not to be sympathetic towards him. He has done bad things, but he understands that and feels great guilt over them. And so despite his sins, we don't see him as a villain, but instead as a human. A very flawed one, but isn't it our flaws that make us human anyway? The quest involving the Lubberkin is also really good. In it, the Baron is forced to look his mistake in the face, to see it in all its horror and ugliness, and to take responsibility, to try to make amends. Doing so earns him redemption in most players, and perhaps also in Geralt's eyes, making for a satisfying narrative arc that allows us to truly empathise with him despite his misdeeds and the difficult subject matter. The outcome of this story feels deeply impactful. Even if you make the choice that leads to the Baron and Anna surviving, it's very hard to imagine a happy ending to this tale when you watch the two of them walk away at the end, and it's even harder to not hope for one anyway. Ultimately, this isn't a story of good and bad, or of victims and villains. It's a tragedy. A very human tragedy where everyone involved seems sympathetic, not despite their flaws, but because of them. This questline reaches a level of storytelling few games manage, thanks to its complex subject matter and realistic characters. I still see people talk about the Bloody Baron to this day, which I think says a lot about how much of an impression this questline leaves on the player. Velen is overall the best area in the game. It's a no man's land in more ways than one. Both of the two main questlines, that of the Bloody Baron and the Crones of Crookback Bog, involve the concept of law and order in a seemingly lawless land. The Baron's story is deeply personal, he has brought ruin upon himself from his failure to enforce his law not over his land but instead over his family. The Crones instead offer their own form of justice to the land. They do protect its inhabitants, in their own way, but underneath their law it's clear the Crones represent something rotten and decaying just like the swamp they reside in, just like the trail of treats where baked goods reveal maggots upon closer inspection, and just like their own hideous appearance that they initially try to hide with a facade of pretend beauty. The build-up as you investigate the swamp and the crones is really good. The player knows something is off, they know there's something rotten underneath it all. There's plenty of signs of this, but the player doesn't actually know what it is, and the process of discovery is drawn out for as long as possible before you get to the final reveal, which, when it does come, really delivers. The way the Baron's story intersects with the Crones is also handled very well. Velen does a great job at showing the consequences of war, and of showing peasant life in all its ugliness, while combining these with a heavy dash of fantasy and superstition. The various side quests tie into its themes of war and law and order very well, making the whole area feel very thematically consistent. Novigrad doesn't do as good a job at telling its own story, but the city itself is very impressive. Novigrad is huge and very detailed. 
It's the most immersive and realistic city I've seen in an RPG. Its streets are cluttered with NPCs in various details. There are loads of examples of industry on the city's outskirts, and it all feels very alive. It's very impressive. But I think its story has some problems. You spend a lot of time looking for Dandelion, which is enjoyable enough, but it doesn't lead to any great payoff like certain other storylines. Dandelion is once more a bit of an idiot that's played for comic relief, as opposed to feeling like an actual representation of his book character, but he's still fun. Sort of. I never understood why his voice sounds so different in the narration sections though. After many trials and tribulations, Geralt finally learned that Yen was in nearby Vizima. Are these sections meant to be an older Dandelion or something? Because despite the difference, he sounds great there. I want that wise sounding Dandelion instead of the useless one we end up with. The criminal underworld is again fine, but Geralt's involvement once more has little payoff. That said, Dijkstra is one of the most enjoyable characters I've seen in an RPG. In a game full of great banter, he has the best, which is quite the achievement. Radovid is a problem I'll come back to, so that just leaves the witch hunts, and that's where Novigrad disappoints slightly. The hunting of witches seems very extreme, as the cruel opening scene of the pyres show us. The problem is, we don't know how things became so extreme, and that makes the situation feel a bit over the top and black and white, things the Witcher series is supposed to avoid. I get that the Eternal Fire has been established as being a very dubious force, but if the reason for their extremeness is simply to show religion as bad, then that's both overly simplistic and a bit boring. And also I thought the Order of the Flaming Rose in the first game were only as extreme as they were because of the role of the Grand Master. So why has Novigrad got to the point where they are openly killing any suspected mage, and even herbalists and pellers? I also seem to remember in the short story, The Lesser Evil, mages are shown as being desirable in civilised areas because their abilities are so useful. It would make more sense if the witch hunts were only happening in Redania. I mean, Radovid has obvious reasons, and it makes sense in other countries as people might blame mages for their dead kings and therefore their current situation. But the free city of Novigrad was supposed to be a haven for mages. Triss says just a year ago everything was fine, so what the hell happened? I think there needs to be a reason for the change which is explained to the player. Perhaps it started off gradually with restrictions to magic's use following the Witcher 2's ending, and that led to some form of retaliation from some other mages and things kept escalating. I mean, maybe that is what happened, but as things are, the situation feels underexplained and almost sensationalist in its depiction of prejudice. Prejudice itself is a good topic for an RPG, but it was already a focus for both the previous games, and they did a better job at showing it in a more believable and interesting way. Overall, Novigrad as an area has the weakest story, but the city is still a great location. Skellige is better, however. Firstly, it looks incredible. It offers breathtaking sight after breathtaking sight. By the time you get to Skellige, you may be getting a bit bored of the open world, but Skellige looks so damn good that I think it's hard for even open world cynics to not get an urge to just get out there and explore a bit when they arrive. It also makes for a great moment when you realise the sheer size of the place, and then realise how much of a game you still have to see, even after however many hours you've put into the game already. The soundtrack's also really good, and I know I said I wasn't going to talk about the soundtrack, but I at least wanted to mention how each island has its own theme designed to give it its own feel, which is an impressive level of detail. The story of the region focuses mostly on showing Skellige culture. That culture itself is not very unique. Viking slash Norse inspired settings are a common thing in fantasy fiction, but it still has a good amount of personality. The game strikes a good balance between portraying the harsh side of the culture, which can border on the barbaric, like the practice of burning the widows of dead kings at the king's funeral, but also managing to show a likeable side to this culture. The real achievement of Skellige's storytelling is how we're introduced to an entire new cast of characters who all feel well realised. But despite this, it doesn't feel overwhelming, and it's easy to get invested into this broad side story of succession and islander politics. The quests The Lord of Unvik and Possession are two of the best in the game, and the way these quests build toward the player deciding the fate of the region is well done and provides good payoff. The choice between Ceres and Hjalmar does seem slightly biased towards Ceres though. There's even a unique place of power you can only access by following her route, which is really stupid. Svanriga also could have really done with more screen time, and preferably an additional side quest where the player gets to at least interact with him a bit. 
Svanriga ends up playing an important part in events, and you can make him king, but it happens through not involving yourself and it's a shame you can't actively support him. It would make sense as he represents a step away from tradition that could be appealing to some players, but many people won't even realise making him king is an option. As for the main story quest, time spent with Yen is enjoyable for the great chemistry between her and Geralt, but this section also establishes an important part of her character. Throughout these quests we see Yen stealing the mask, then using it with little concern for the possible consequences, and finally using necromancy to speak to Skarl. This shows the player the length she's willing to go to to find Ciri, that she'll do whatever it takes regardless of the consequences, and there are consequences for her. By the end of your time in Skellige she is pretty hated by the islanders, and the player understands the importance of Ciri to her as a result. There's also the romance side plot, and this seems a good time to talk about that. All things considered, it's handled surprisingly well. The scenes with Triss are incredibly bittersweet, and the writers really nail the feeling of two people with a past history and unresolved feelings. It's a shame the game asks the player to decide whether they want to romance Triss so early, as how can the player know without having spent time with Yen also, which you probably haven't done at this point. It also doesn't allow the player to change their mind later on, which they may want to do, and the threesome scene that can result from the player's understandable indecisiveness is a bit unfair. It's also silly how the game never cares about you sleeping around as Geralt in the past, and still allows it without consequence in this game, but still punishes you for romancing both main characters. As for Yen, the writers do a good job at staying faithful to her character and capturing her relationship with Geralt. The way the quest The Last Wish allows you to decide Geralt's feelings while staying true to his character is a bit contrived, but it definitely feels like the writers are trying to make the best out of a complicated situation, while allowing players the freedom to choose what they want. And that choice is very important. I know it meant a lot to me personally. In fact, even on my second playthrough I couldn't help but choose the same thing as it just felt right, and that's not a common thing for me. I've done a lot of evil deeds in RPGs just to see what happens differently, but when it comes to deciding the fate of who my boy Geralt ends up with, I don't know, that's different man, that's, that's different. Once you've completed the main quests of Velen, Novigrad and Skellige, you'll find out about Uma and head to Kaer Morhen. The scene where the witches drink together is really good. I don't think much needs to be said about how it ends up. Lambert, you're a genius. Of course I am! So, we inviting the lodge to our bash? Fuck yeah! Summon the bitches! Although moments that can make players truly laugh out loud are quite the achievement. I do want to praise the earlier conversation though because it really feels like catching up with old friends. It's great and the way the conversation jumps between serious and light-hearted moments is really impressive. Kaer Morhen also gives the player a lot of information about witches and the negatives to their lifestyle. Whether it's from Geralt's monologues when exploring or from Lambert's scathing commentary. Ultimately, you'll free Avalak, who reveals the location of Ciri, but before finding her, you get a chance to enlist the help of allies, and that provides a good opportunity to remind the player of all they've done so far, as well as rewarding you for having helped various people. It's a real shame Yorvuth isn't in the game though. I know it's because of cut content, and it's hard to complain about that when the game does have so much content included, but the consequences of importing a save from The Witcher 2 are already quite small, and if there's one decision that should have had an impact on the third game, it's whether you help Yorvuth or Roach. That was the main decision after all, and it doesn't make sense if you help Yorvuth, why Roach is still willing to come to Kaer Morhen and die for you. Roach is honestly really boring in The Witcher 3, probably because the writers needed to make his character work no matter which path you import, and he suffered as a result. Having Yorvuth included in the game, and both him and Roach acknowledge your past history more, would have been really nice for returning players. Regardless, with your allies assembled you can finally go get Ciri, and the cutscene where you find her is easily one of the game's greatest moments. The camera shots in particular are outstanding here. You have spent so many hours looking for Ciri that this moment really feels deserved, like you've earned this reunion, and it's easy to feel emotional now it's here. The following battle at Kaer Morhen is so built up it feels like it's going to be the game's finale. There are things you could criticise, but I think the developers do a good job at making this a big dramatic set piece. It's something a lot of games try and fail at. It ends with Besimir's death in another touching scene. If someone was going to die, I guess it was going to be him, but it really does feel like his death represents the end of an era. 
He was the last witcher of old, the one who still held to some of the witcher tradition, and he was a father figure for the other witchers. His death feels important in more ways than one. If you thought the story was almost coming to an end with the battle at Cairn Warren, you'll soon realise you're wrong, there's still a lot to see. The bald mountain section with Ciri is decent. Both of the big fights are fun, and what better way for a father and daughter to bond than spending some quality time killing supernatural foes together. The quest with Avalak is even more impressive. Seeing such different lands is sure to take you by surprise and capture your imagination. However, as a way of fleshing out Eredin and making his motivations understandable, this was a big missed opportunity. When we do get to the flashback of Eredin killing the previous king, all we get is this. The king is dead. Long live the king. Which doesn't tell non-book readers much about Eredin at all. As a result, Eredin remains disappointing. In a series full of really strong characters, one weak character would be forgivable, unless that character happens to be the main antagonist. The Wild Hunt also never seemed very interesting. Like many things in The Witcher, The Wild Hunt is based off mythology, but the twist, that they're not just spectral riders but actually a bunch of dimension hopping elves, has already been revealed in the books. So there aren't any surprises to them, and they seem a bit weird. Their edgy outfits and supernatural aspects seem a bit at odds with their elven background, and any interesting parts of their backstory seem a bit lost without knowledge of the books. Then, there's Radovid, and the assassination plot. It should be said that the end section of this game was obviously affected by cut content, and as I said not long ago, it's hard to be too critical when the game is as big as it is, but when it comes to Radovid, they should have really done better. First up is the change in personality. He's become more extreme and more crazy, which can be a little disappointing, but the real problem is at the same time we're told how this guy is some great military genius. Yet when we meet him, he seems like a crazy fool. How exactly is this guy supposed to have defeated Henselt in a single season exactly? We already know Henselt's no joke, and he was potentially in a very powerful position at the end of The Witcher 2, so it's disappointing how Radovid seems to have become exaggerated just to create an extra villain, and it's confusing how we're meant to somehow buy his military genius, but it's the quest to kill him that's the real problem. It's clearly rushed, but it's the end decision that really lets it down. Dijkstra is a smart guy who knows Geralt quite well. How could he possibly think Geralt would sit back and let him kill Roach in cold blood? It doesn't make any sense. Don't tell me Witcher neutrality, because Dijkstra should be one of the last people to believe that crap. Also, the player's hand is completely forced here by this contrived choice. This is meant to be the choice to decide the fate of the war. I hate Nilfgaard. All I want from the war is for them to lose. And I love Dijkstra. But the choice you're given is whether to let Roach be murdered. Roach, who has just come to care Morhun to risk his life for you. Let alone all the events of The Witcher 2. How can you let him die? And if by some miracle you don't care about Roach, they also included Tala, just to make sure it's even more one-sided, like, come on! Why even give the player a choice? Everyone's going to oppose Dijkstra here because the alternative is so ridiculous. So, Nilfgaard win the war. Great. That's great. It's not like I spent years looking forward to stopping Nilfgaard or anything. So, really great choice. I loved the part where stupid things happened for stupid reasons, leading to a stupid outcome that I didn't even want. But, back to the main story. After some more quests, we get to the main ending sequence, and it's reasonably impressive. You get some okay boss fights against Karamthir and Eredin, getting to control an overpowered Ciri who one-shots everything is quite satisfying, and poor Crack dies to add some drama to the proceedings. So far so good, but the worst is yet to come. Upon killing Eredin, you're told Avalak has betrayed you, and considering all the foreshadowing for this, that seems very predictable. But then when you get there, surprise, he hasn't really betrayed you. He was just set up as a red herring to provide a bit of extra drama. I don't think this works that well, as people who haven't read the books don't know Avalak very much, and so as a red herring he's a bit pointless. Of course you don't know whether to trust him, because you don't know him very well, at all. So nothing that happens is much of a surprise or shock. For book readers, it's even weirder though. Avalak isn't a very nice guy. He does some bad things in regards to Ciri. 
and it's definitely established how he's out for himself in the books. But in the game, he just seems to have been changed into a morally good character, and his complete obsession with Ciri's bloodline is just ignored. I think him betraying Ciri is a lot truer to his character. The foreshadowing of his betrayal would need to be toned down, but the result would make for a more interesting ending. Then, there's the White Frost. Like many things in the books, the White Frost was left somewhat ambiguous, with the reader not knowing whether it's just the coming of a normal Ice Age. But the game does away with that to make it some mysterious supernatural phenomenon. But why exactly does it show up at the end of the game? We summoned Eredin. Why does a conjunction of the spheres happen, and how does that make the White Frost appear? It's left pretty vague. And speaking of vague, how exactly does Ciri stop it? And why didn't she do that earlier? It's all pretty deus ex machina, and I guess the player is just expected to go along with it and not question anything too much. The story feels a bit like it buckles under its own weight towards the end. For non-book readers, things get very convoluted, what with Eredin, the Wild Hunt, the White Frost, Ciri and El, and Shay, time travel, alternate worlds, Elder Blood, and so on. For book readers, the series already had a satisfying ending which has been written over. And that's fine, but this is an event that's been built up over the course of three games now, and for all this build up, the payoff is pretty disappointing. And as for the fate of Ciri, the decisions that lead to it aren't terrible, but they're not exactly good either. There's four or five small choices, depending on whether you go see Amir, and the only one that feels like it should truly affect Ciri's fate is the final one, whether you let her go to Scarl's grave or not. The others are far too minor. Letting Ciri trash Avalak's hideout doesn't seem like something that should be linked with saving her life. Also, the timers during these choices immediately seem out of place and let the player know something's up with them, which makes the timers seem unnecessary and perhaps even counterproductive. If they wanted Ciri's fate to be based off minor things, they should have ditched the timers and included a few more choices so the outcome feels a bit fairer and less random. But for all of those complaints, I still love this game's story. The main storyline isn't great and the ending has several big problems, but you know what? This game fails at some things, but it succeeds at the most important thing of all, making you care. You care about these characters. After so many hours, and maybe so many books and other games, you really do feel like you know them, like they matter, and as a result you're emotionally invested in the story. All three epilogues are great because you do care what happens to Ciri. The bad ending feels depressing and Geralt chasing after Ciri's medallion makes for a fitting ending. The Empress of Nilfgaard ending is very bittersweet. It's also arguably the best ending for the world, as Nilfgaard ruled by Ciri might be more likely to lead to peace and tolerance than the alternatives. Finally, the Witcher ending does a great job at building suspense. Riding through White Orchard one last time is strangely nostalgic, and making the player wait to find out what happened to Ciri makes the happy ending even happier. This was the ending I got when I first completed the game. At the time, I didn't know whether I had the good or bad ending, or what the fate of Ciri was. Seeing the scene with Emir, I thought she was dead. Then, upon getting the sword, a small spark of hope kindled inside me, and finally seeing her at the end felt really great. I felt genuine happiness and relief. And it's because I did care about Ciri. And Geralt. And the world. A world that has been brought to life for its great characters, creating a story that is flawed, but also felt meaningful and emotional. Strong characters have always been the main strength of the series, even when they look like this. And by strong characters I don't mean characters that are actually strong, or that are likeable, or even have a lot of depth. Instead I think it's best defined as characters who feel like they actually exist, and aren't just there for the sake of the story or for the protagonist to interact with. Characters that are believable, and whose believability makes them interesting. And that's the case with the characters in this game, from the main characters down to the minor ones, the characterization is consistently really well done, and it adds so much to the experience. And just behind the great characters is the great world building. The world of The Witcher is interesting, and now it's been brought to life with such detail and on such an impressive scale. It's a world full of stories to tell, and they are stories worth discovering. 
in many ways the gameplay doesn't do them justice. The gameplay sections of quests are straightforward, combat gets repetitive, and the open world is structured in an uninteresting way that makes exploration neither rewarding nor engaging. But despite that, the stories this game tells still feel like they're worth hearing, and the world feels like it's worth seeing. The gameplay may not be anything special, but there are many other things that are. From the sheer quantity of quality content, to its writing, to the small details, or its ability to surprise you, or any one of the great quests, or its fantastic characters, or maybe something else. There's so much to appreciate. How much the game's flaws detract from the experience will depend on the player, but we also shouldn't forget that part of the reason this game is so flawed is because this game was so ambitious. For the entire Witcher series, Sera Project didn't just try to make incremental improvements and improve on the formula established by each previous game. Each new game feels completely different. With each instalment they tried to make something new and make something that was great. They aimed big, and maybe some of the game's flaws are part of the result, but would you honestly have it any other way? Would you rather they played it safe, stuck to what they knew? Would you rather have something that was more polished and less ambitious? I know I wouldn't. There have been a lot of great games over the last 10 years. A lot of games that have won awards or have high Metacritic scores and so on. But of all of them, The Witcher 3 feels like the most special to me, not because it's objectively the best, but because it made me care about its world and its characters. It gave me hours of content to just get lost in, and I loved every second of it. Whether The Witcher 3 is a masterpiece or not, I don't know. But I guarantee this game will continue to be talked about and enjoyed for years and years to come. And there may not be any greater achievement than that. Fog's thick as curdled milk. Never took you for a poet. Oh, but I am one. Wanna hear a limerick? Sure. Lambert, Lambert, what a prick. Not bad. <laughs>